Chapter 38. How, without disturbing himself, Athos obtained his equipment. D'Artagnan was so completely confounded that, without considering what would become of Kitty, he ran through half of Paris and did not stop till he found himself at Athos's door. The confusion of his mind, the terror which spurred him on, the shouts of some of the watch who had pursued him, only made him the more expeditious in his progress. He traversed the court, mounted the two flights of stairs, and knocked as if he would break down the door. Grimaud opened it with eyes swollen by sleep, and D'Artagnan rushed into the antechamber with such violence as almost to overthrow him as he passed. This time, at any rate, in spite of his habitual taciturnity, Grimaud found his tongue. Hello, he cried. What do you want, hussy? D'Artagnan then rid himself of the woman's hood and cloak given him to escape in by Kitty. At the sight of D'Artagnan's naked sword, the poor fellow saw that he had to deal with a man, with some assassin, perhaps. Help, help, murder, exclaimed he. Be silent, you unlucky dog, said the young man. I'm D'Artagnan. Do you not know me? Where's your master? You, Monsieur D'Artagnan, exclaimed the panic-stricken Grimaud. Impossible! Grimaud, said Athos, as he quietly emerged from his chamber in his dressing gown. Grimaud, I believe that you are permitting yourself to speak. Ah, sir, it is because... Silence! Grimaud then contented himself with pointing to D'Artagnan with his finger. Athos, phlegmatic as he was, burst out into a fit of laughter, which was occasioned by D'Artagnan's wild appearance, hood askew, skirt falling, sleeves tucked up, mustache bristling. Do not laugh, my friend, exclaimed D'Artagnan. In the name of heaven, do not laugh, for upon my soul I assure you that there is nothing to laugh at. He uttered these words with so much solemnity and with such undissembled horror that Athos immediately seized his hands, saying, Are you wounded, my friend? You are very pale. No, but something very terrible has just happened to me. Are you alone, Athos? Sang Dieu, what would you expect... To, uh, who would you expect to be with me at this time of night? Good, good. And D'Artagnan hurried into Athos's chamber. Well, speak now, said the latter, bolting the door. Is the king dead? Have you killed the cardinal? You are altogether upset. Come, speak, for I'm dying with anxiety. Athos, replied D'Artagnan, prepare to hear something perfectly incredible, unparalleled. Speak then, speak, said Athos. Well then, continued D'Artagnan, bending toward Athos's ear and whispering, her ladyship is branded with a fleur de lis upon her shoulder. Ah, exclaimed the musketeer as if he had received a bullet in his heart. But you are quite sure, continued D'Artagnan, that the other is really dead? The other, murmured Athos in a voice so faint as scarcely to be audible. Yes, she of whom you told me one day at Amiens? Athos groaned, and his head fell upon his hands. This one, said D'Artagnan, is a woman of from twenty-six to twenty-eight years of age. Blonde, said Athos, yes. With clear blue eyes of an uncommon brightness, and with black eyelashes and eyebrows, yes. Tall and well-made, has she also lost a tooth near the eye tooth on the left side? Yes. The fleur de lis is small, of a red color, and as if somewhat effaced by layers of paste applied to it? Yes. And yet you say that this woman is English. She is called my lady, but she may yet be a French woman. Lord de Winter is only her brother-in-law. I must see her, D'Artagnan. Take care, Athos, take care. You wished to kill her. She is a woman who would willingly pay you back and is not likely to fail. She dare not say a word. It would be denouncing herself. She's equal to anything. Did you ever see her furious? No, said Athos. A tigress, a panther, oh, my dear Athos. I fear that I have drawn down upon us both a terrible vengeance. D'Artagnan then recounted everything, the lady's maddened rage and her menaces of death. You are quite right, and upon my soul I would sell my life for a hair, said Athos. Happily, however, we leave Paris the day after tomorrow, and shall probably go to La Rochelle. Once off, she will pursue you to the end of the world, Athos, should she recognize you. Let her then vent her hatred on me alone. 
Ah, my friend, what does it signify that she should kill me, said Athos? Do you for an instant suppose that I am at all anxious to live? There's some horrible mystery under all this, Athos. I'm certain that this woman is one of the cardinal's spies. In that case, take care of yourself. If the cardinal does not greatly admire you for that London affair, he hates you thoroughly. But as he has, all being considered, nothing to bring forward openly against you, and yet must gratify his revenge, take care of yourself. If you go out, do not go alone. If you eat, use every precaution. Distrust everything, even your own shadow. Happily, said D'Artagnan, we need only manage till tomorrow evening without accident. For when once with the army, I hope that we shall only have men to fear. In the meantime, said Athos, I renounce my plan of seclusion and shall go everywhere with you. You must return to the Rue de Fossoyeurs and I will accompany you. Be it so, my dear Athos, but first let me return to you this ring, which I received from that woman. The sapphire is yours. Did you not tell me that it was a family jewel? Yes, my father gave two thousand crowns for it, as he formerly told me. It was part of the marriage present that he made my mother. It is magnificent. My mother gave it to me, and instead of guarding it as a sacred relic, madman that I was, I gave it to that wretch. Well, take back your ring, for I understand that you must prize it. I take it after it has passed through that wretch's hands? Never. The ring is polluted, D'Artagnan. Then sell it or pledge it. You can borrow a thousand crowns on it. With that sum, you'll be well off, and then with the first money you obtain, you can redeem it, cleansed of its ancient stains, since it will have passed through the hands of usurers. Athos smiled. You are a charming companion, my dear D'Artagnan, said he. Your eternal gaiety revives the souls of the afflicted. Well, then, let us pledge this ring of mine, but on one condition. And what is that? That you will have five hundred crowns, and I shall have five hundred. But think a moment, Athos, I shall not want a quarter of that sum. I, who am only in the guards, and by selling my saddles I can easily procure it. What do I really want? A horse for planchette, nothing more. Besides, you forget that I have a ring also, which you value even more than I do mine, at least I think I've so observed. Yes, for in extremities it might relieve us not only from great embarrassment, but even from great danger. It is not only a simple diamond, it's also an enchanted talisman. I do not understand you, yet I believe what you say. But to return to my ring, or rather ours, you shall take half the sum it may produce, or I will throw it into the sign, and I much doubt whether, as in the case of Polycrates, a fish would be so obliging as to restore it to us. Well, then I agree to it, said D'Artagnan. At this moment, Grimaud came in, accompanied by Planchette, who was uneasy about his master and anxious to know what had happened to him. Athos dressed himself, and when he was ready to go out, made the gesture of a man taking aim to Grimaud. The latter immediately took down his carbine and prepared to follow his master. D'Artagnan and Athos, attended by their servants, reached the Rue de Fossoyeurs in safety, Monsieur Bonancieux was at his door and looked at D'Artagnan with a bantering air. Hello, my dear lodger, said he. Make haste. There's a pretty young girl waiting for you, and the women, you know, do not like to be kept waiting. It is Kitty, exclaimed D'Artagnan to himself as he rushed toward the stairs. In fact, on the landing place before his apartment, and crouching against his door, he found the poor trembling girl. As soon as she saw him, she exclaimed, you promised me your protection. You promised to save me from her anger. Remember, it is you who have ruined me? Yes, certainly, said D'Artagnan. Make yourself easy about that, Kitty. But what happened after I was gone? I can scarcely tell, replied Kitty. At the outcries she made, the lackeys ran to her. She was furious with passion. Whatever can be uttered in the way of imprecation, she vomited forth against you. Then I thought she would remember that it was through my room that you had entered hers and would take me for your accomplice, so I collected the little money that I had in my most precious clothes and ran hither for safety. Poor child, but what am I to do with you? I'm going off the day after tomorrow. Anything you like, sir, send me away from Paris, send me out of France. But I cannot take you with me to the siege of La Rochelle, said D'Artagnan. No, but you might place me in the service of some lady or your acquaintance in your own province, for instance." Ah, my child, in my own province, the ladies have no waiting maids. 
But wait, I know what I will do. Planchette, go to Aramis and ask him to come here directly. We have matters of great importance to discuss with him. I understand, said Athos, but why not Porthos? It appears to me that his marchioness, Porthos's marchioness, sooner than keep a lady's maid, would have her clothes put on by her husband's clerks, said D'Artagnan, laughing. Besides, Kitty would rather not live in the Rua hours, would you, Kitty? I will live where you please, said Kitty, provided I am concealed and that nobody knows where I am. But Kitty, now that we are going to be separated and that you are therefore no longer jealous of me, Sir, interrupted Kitty, far or near, I shall never cease to love you. Where the plague does constancy repair to nestle, muttered Athos. And I also, said D'Artagnan, I also shall always love you, you may be sure. But now answer me, this question is one of great importance. Did you never hear anything said about a young woman who was abducted one night? Wait a minute, oh, mon dear sir, do you still love that woman? No, it is one of my friends who loves her. Yes, it is Athos there. I, exclaimed Athos in a tone pretty much like that of the man who sees himself about to tread upon an adder. Yes, to be sure you, said D'Artagnan, pressing Athos's hand. You know the interest that we all take in poor little Madame Bonancieux. Besides, Kitty will not tell you, will you, Kitty? You understand, my child, exclaimed D'Artagnan, that she is the wife of that ugly ape whom you saw upon the doorstep as you came in. Oh, my God, exclaimed Kitty. You remind me how frightened I was lest he should have recognized me. How? Recognized? Then you've seen this man before? Yes, he came twice to my ladies. As might be expected. About what time? About a fortnight ago. Just about the time. And yesterday evening he came again. Yesterday evening? Yes, but a minute before you came yourself. My dear Athos, we are enveloped in a web of spies. And do you believe that he recognized you, Kitty? I drew down my hood when I saw him, but perhaps it was too late. Go down, Athos, he suspects you less than me, and see whether he's still at the door. Athos went down and returned immediately. He's gone, said he, and the house is closed. He has gone to make his report and to say that all the pigeons are at this moment in the dovecot. Well, then, let us be off, said Athos, leaving only Planchette here to bring us intelligence. Wait one instant, and what about Aramis, whom we've sent for? True, said Athos, let us wait for Aramis. An instant afterwards, Aramis entered. They explained the affair to him and told him how urgent it was for him to find, amongst some of his high connections, a situation for Kitty. And will this really be a service to you, D'Artagnan? I will be grateful for it forever. Well then, Madame de Bois Tracy has requested me to find a trustworthy waiting maid for one of her friends, who lives in the provinces, and if you, my dear D'Artagnan, can answer for the young woman... Oh, sir, exclaimed Kitty, I shall be entirely devoted, be assured, to the lady who will give me the means of leaving Paris. Then, said Aramis, nothing can be better. He sat himself down at the table and wrote a short note, which he sealed with a ring and gave to Kitty. And now, my child, said D'Artagnan, you know that this place is no safer for us than for you. So let us separate. We shall meet again in happier days. And at whatever time or place we may meet again, sir, said Kitty, you will find me loving you still more than now. A gamester's vow, said Athos, while D'Artagnan was accompanying Kitty down the stairs. A few minutes afterwards, the, free, the three friends separated after making an appointment for four o'clock at Athos's chambers and leaving Planchette to mind the house. Aramis returned home, and Athos and D'Artagnan busied themselves about pledging the sapphire. As Argasson had foreseen, they easily procured 300 pistoles on the ring, and the Jew, moreover, declared that if they chose to sell it, as it would make a splendid drop for earrings, he would give as much as 500 pistoles for it. Athos and D'Artagnan, with the activity of two soldiers and the science of two connoisseurs, scarcely spent three hours in purchasing the equipment of the musketeer. Besides, Athos had the character and manners of a nobleman, even to his fingers' ends. Directly anything suited him. He paid for it at once without haggling to reduce the price. D'Artagnan wished to make some objections to this, but Athos laid his hand on his shoulder, smiling, 
and D'Artagnan understood that it was very well for a little Gasson gentleman like him to bargain, but not for a man who had the deportment of a prince. The musketeer saw a superb Andalusian horse, as black as jet with fiery nostrils and fine and elegant legs, rising six years. He examined it and found it faultless. He got it for a thousand francs. Perhaps he might have had it for less, but while D'Artagnan was discussing the price with the dealer, Athos counted down the hundred pistoles on the table. Grimaud had a cob from Picardy, which cost three hundred francs. But when the saddle of this latter horse and Grimaud's arms were bought, Athos had not one so remaining of the hundred and fifty pistoles. D'Artagnan therefore begged his friend to bite a mouthful out of his share, which he could restore to him afterwards if he chose. But Athos only answered by shrugging his shoulders. How much did he say he would give for the sapphire to buy it out and out? asked he at last. Five hundred pistoles. That is two hundred pistoles more, a hundred for each of us. Why, that's quite a fortune. Let us go to him again, my friend. But would you really do this? Yes, this ring would unquestionably recall memories too melancholy. Besides, we shall never have three hundred pistoles to redeem it with. Therefore, we should actually lose two hundred by the bargain. Go and tell him that the ring is his, D'Artagnan, and come back with the two hundred pistoles. Reflect, Athos. Ready money is scarce in these times, and we should learn to make sacrifices. Go, D'Artagnan, go. Grimaud shall bear you company with his carbine. Half an hour later, D'Artagnan returned with the two hundred, having no accident befallen him on his way. It was thus that Athos found, without giving himself any trouble, resources which he did not expect.